Hello. So yes, a few years ago I realized that nobody really buys computers. They don't buy software. And they don't buy hardware. What they're really buying is a solution of some type. You're trying to solve a problem of some type. And it just so happens that computers can do that. Even if what you're trying to do is simply playing a game, that's why you buy the computer. If you could play the game through a deck of cards, or you play the game with two tin cans attached by a string, you would. But computers make it easier and sometimes more fun to play that game. That's the problem. And if that is the problem, if that's why you're buying a computer, it really doesn't make that much difference whether you use closed source or open source or free software, as long as it solves the problem. And that's the issue you have to get across to people. However, my understanding, my experience has been that free software in the end will give you a better solution than closed source software. And that's why I've spent the last quarter century advocating the use of free software. Now, I'm going to first start talking about Project Kawan. It's a project that I started in 2007, over 12 years ago. And it's because I was at a conference just like this, where a young person came up to me and said, Mad Dog, how do I make money with free software? Now, this brings up a little side story. My mother never understood what I did as a living. When I started in 1969, she said, John, she never called me Mad Dog, she said, John, <laughs> what do you do? And I tried to tell her, but she had never really touched a computer before. There was no computer in her house. And so it was very difficult for her to understand. Many years later, when she did have a computer, she finally came up to me and said, John, I think I know what you do for a living. You write the programs that work on my computer. I said, Mom, I used to do that, but now really, I don't do that much programming anymore. I actually earn my living trying to sell free software. And she thought about that for about 10 seconds. She goes, never mind. <laughs> But there's many ways you can make money with free software. And the people that say that you can't make money with free software obviously have not heard of a company called Red Hat. Or actually, they even haven't heard of a company called IBM. Because for the last 30 years, IBM has not, in their advertising, even one time, mentioned a piece of hardware or a piece of software. They only say, we're selling business solutions. And yet they are what they are the largest and you know company on the face of the earth is selling computers. Now I thought about this and of course I could have said you could be a systems administrator, you could you know help people use their software better, you could be a consultant like I am, and charge money for your services. But I realized that this person was asking me more than that. They wanted to know how they could create a business using free software to earn a living. And so I started thinking about this. And in 2010, I was joined by a man named Douglas Conrad, who was success a successful person at creating an industry, a business around free software here in Brazil. And he employed 60 people. He created jobs for 60 people in his company selling free software, actually selling a solution of free software. And then later on, I was joined by other people, and eventually in 2015, we had a small pilot of what I called Project Kawan. Now, there are many goals of Project Kawan, and this has been going on for a long time. We have many different methods of implementing Project Kawan, which I'll get to in a moment. But the goals of Project Kawan have always been the same. Number one, and the first number one, is to create millions of new private sector jobs, not government jobs, private sector jobs, of people to earn money with free software. 
starting in Brazil first and spreading out through the rest of Latin America and probably throughout the world. We also wanted to make computers easier to use. Notice I did not use the word easy. Computers, in my viewpoint, will never be easy to use, only easier. And so Project Cowat has that as a goal. To create a more environmentally friendly computer. Now, Brazil is an interesting country because you go north to south and you straddle the equator. That means that in half of your country, it gets so hot and is constantly so hot. You don't have a summer, you don't have a winter, you just have hot, <laughs> right? Hesifi, Manaus, you know, hot and humid. And you also never really have bought into central air conditioning. You have all these little air conditioners up on the wall that are constantly trying to take the hot air in the room and blow it outside to the even hotter air outside, right? And this uses a lot of electrical power. But at the same time, you have these electric space heaters in your rooms, in your offices, in your homes, these electric space heaters. And they're constantly generating heat inside your room for the air conditioner to blow on the outside. Now, some of you call these space heaters PCs. The PCs use 450 watts of power, 500 watts of power. In some gaming computers, 1,000 watts of power, 2,000 watts of power. And most of that is heat. And it comes into the room, and the air conditioner has to blow it on the outside. Now, if you can cut down that heat inside the room, then your air conditioner does not have to work as hard, and you save money twice. Number one, in the electricity to run your computer, and number two, in the air conditioning to cool the room. More importantly, if you could concentrate that heat in one place, then you might actually be able to use it to do something useful. As an example, a lot of you have these showers that use electricity to warm the water at the last moment. They never quite work. I still freeze, okay? And not only that, but you guys have lots of electricity right next to lots of water. This is very dangerous. <laughs> but what would happen if you use that heat for computing to preheat the water, the cold water coming in from the street, into your hot water tanks, or maybe use it to heat a swimming pool or something like that. You could channel that heat. And that's another goal of Project Kawat. To decrease cellular contention. How many of you remember the first Apple iPhone? Apple made a deal with AT&T in New York City to be the carrier for the iPhone. And people bought the iPhone, you know, thousands of people in New York City bought the iPhone, and AT&T said, yes, we're the carrier, and they turned on their iPhone and started to do what everybody does with a phone, download pornography. <laughs> and instantly, the AT&T cellular network crashed because of the number of people downloading porn at one time. And so AT&T built up their network, made the cells smaller, fewer number of people in each cellular part. It was working fine. And then Apple released the iPhone 2, and it crashed again. <laughs> wow, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> and so this is, you know, this is a slight problem. And this is one of my laws that in reality, people download as much porn for every piece of internet you give them. So what you have to do is you have to make incredibly small cells. We call Pico cells. And the only way of doing that without putting an antenna on every single person's roof is to use a different method of doing this, which basically is to switch the load over to Wi-Fi. Download your porn over Wi-Fi and then save the cellular network for the other things you need. And Project Kawa has a way of doing that. In fact, we could create 
an absolutely free and high-performance Wi-Fi bubble over the entire city. That you could walk outside of your apartment, open up your phone, and attach to the Wi-Fi network, and have as much Wi-Fi network as you wanted. And this is the way that God and Al, and Al Gore intended the internet to be. And we know how to do that. We also want to create low cost or even free supercomputing. Because if you're in industry, and particularly if you're doing things like AI, you need a lot of computing power. We know how to do that. And finally, to create all of this using sustainable private funding, no money from the government. Now I know a lot of us don't like the government and stuff like that, but let me tell you something. I really hate the government. <laughs> and I do know one thing. Sometimes the government is useful, but you can't depend on them. Because one day it's one party that has one feeling, and the next day it's another party that has a different feeling, and you can't have a sustainable program that way. The only way you can do that is by having a real solution in the private sector. That's for self-funding. So the structure of Project Kawan is not one company that has millions of employees. We have millions of companies that only have one employee. You and you, right? And all of this was facilitated by President Lula's organization with the Micro Entrepreneur Act that says if you're a company of one or two people, you can set up your company by going to a website, putting your information in, hitting return, and paying like 20 or 30 reais, boom, you're a company. Why is that important? Because now you have protection as a company. And you can start to do things like go to a bank and borrow money and stuff like that. It's very important. If you try to do it the old way or before this act happened, it could take you six or seven years and multiple thousands of reais to create this company. I know because I've known people to try that. So each one of these Project Kawa professionals would earn money by helping to support small business people in how to use their computers. Because the small business person is sitting there and they have computers, but they don't really know how to use them. And you have the technical expertise to use them, to, to help them, but a lot of you don't know how to start your own company and keep it going. And Project Kawa is to bridge that gap. We are a nonprofit organization. We're not into this to make money. We're into this to help other people get jobs. You'll see more about that later. Now, I'm going to remind you of something in computer science. There is something known as a stack inside your computer. And as you have interrupts, the information which you're processing right now gets pushed down on the stack. It goes further down the stack and you do something new. And then that may be interrupted and that gets put on the stack and gets pushed down. But eventually you return from whatever you're doing and you pop the things off the stack. And this is what has happened to Project Kawa over the years. And I will explain what that means. So version 1.0 of Project Kawa was to look at a city like Sao Paulo. Huge, dense city filled with people. And the interesting thing about uh, Sao Paulo and a lot of the cities in Brazil is that right now about 86% of the people in Brazil live in this urban environment. Only 14% live in a rural environment like on a farm. In addition to that, it's incredibly dense. You have 12 times the population density of Manhattan. Now there's a trick to this because Manhattan is mostly businesses and people don't really live there. They live in Brooklyn or Bronx or other places. But you combine the people living with retail and office buildings and stuff like that. 
In the United States, small business is one to 50 people. Medium is 50 to 500. In Brazil, small is one to 30, and medium is 30 to 300. But more importantly than that, 90% of your gross domestic product comes from small to medium business. 90% of your ideas come from small business. Business is just starting up. And a lot of large companies will buy those ideas from you or incorporate your business into them, but they don't necessarily create those ideas. So recognizing all of this, I said, what would happen if Project Cowan could actually create computing as a service? Much like a cloud, except very local. And that meant that I had to go back and retrofit all of those tall buildings with good ethernet. And that was very difficult because those buildings are already built. It's very expensive putting in that wiring, that cabling through those buildings. And so I decided to push down this project, not forget about it, but push it down and think about something else for Project Kawan. Because there was too much money to retrofit those buildings it was too long a lead time. So the best time to, to implement Project Kawa would be when the building was being designed. And then you go to the architect and said, put in these things which we need for Project Kawa. And they would do that and the building would be built. But in the meantime, what do you do as a business? And so I pushed it down. However, about six months ago, I thought of a way of solving that problem because the networking in those buildings already exists. They are copper twisted wires that we put into the building for old dial telephones, landline telephones that nobody uses anymore. But the wiring is still there. It goes from the basement of the building all the way up to every apartment, every office, in the building. And we would be able to put twisted wire ethernet into those buildings and use those as the communications for Project Kawan. But we'll get back to that later on. So I went to version 0.5 and 0.01. Now notice that I'm keeping, I'm not going up in versions, I'm going down. And that's because when you develop software, version 1.0 means you're ready for mass consumption. So we're not quite ready yet, but we still have some things that are interesting along the way. And I thought about taking Project Kawan and making some home media centers out of it, giving people nice stereo systems or even you know, 5.1 or 7.1 surround sound systems using just a single board computer, like a Raspberry Pi, and connecting to the internet and using that Raspberry Pi as the first interface for digital inclusion people, people that can't afford a real computer. Because now they could use their TV set, stick this computer on it, add a keyboard and a mouse, and have that first connection to the internet. Why is this important? It's important because if they have that connection, then you can use that connection to do training, to do education in the home. You can allow people who are on welfare to manage their resources, to manage their financial resources in the home. You can create jobs for these people in the home. They could be a call center in the home. Single parents, people who can't leave the house, physically handicapped, can have a job in the home. And we could do that if more people had that internet connection. Project Kawan could help that. But that required to have a Raspberry Pi. And as we know, the Raspberry Pi is a little bit expensive here in Brazil. And it doesn't really create jobs in Brazil for the manufacturing of the Raspberry Pi. There was a couple of other issues about it. People said, well, I don't really like paying monthly for this thing that I could just buy. 
That's a service level agreement. So you have to give them a reason to buy that service level agreement. And so I couldn't figure that out, so I pushed it down. Which brought me to version 0.0. Now I can't get any lower than that, can I? I don't really want to go to negative versions. That's bad. So I had to make version 0 work. And so I started looking at another problem that happens in Latin America. The problem of Latin America is that most of your federal and state universities are free of tuition. And so if you qualify as a student, you can go to these universities without having to pay the thousands of dollars that it costs in the United States to go to a university. However, 40% of the people who qualify for that free tuition university education still cannot accept it because they come from small towns outside of the cities where the university is and they don't, their family does not have enough money for the apartment, for the uh, electricity, for the internet, for the computers, for the books. And so these students who do qualify cannot accept that. Some of them try and get money by flipping hamburgers or waiting on tables, but that usually doesn't produce enough money. And number two, it's not what they're going to university for. They're not going to university to learn how to flip hamburgers or wait on tables. So if I could create a job for these students to use their information that they know already to help to support small business people, that is a marriage made in heaven. How many of you have been fixing the computers of your parents ever since you were like eight years old? Yeah, that's what I thought. And oh, that, by the way, it's not just your parents, it's like everybody on your street, okay? So you had this knowledge that by the time you got to university, you could do all these things. You could replace the failing or failed disk drive. You could look at the log files and say, hey, I can see that this part's about to fail. You could install new versions of the operating system. You could get rid of spam and viruses and things like that. You knew how to do all of that, but you didn't know how to sell yourself. You didn't know how to turn that into a business. Or if you did, it's what we call break and fix. It's broken, somebody brings it to you, and you fix it. Well, small business people don't, can't take their computers out of their business and bring them to you. They, they want you to come there. And if the computer is broken, they're already in trouble. What they need is what we call a maintenance contract, that you go in once a week, see what's wrong or what's about to fail, and you fix it before it does. And if it does break, well, then you're right there to help them out. And that's what Project Kawa is about. It's about helping high school students who would go to university or university students who are there already have this job that will pay them more money and be the thing that they want to do, learning about computers. And so what type of services are we talking about? Installing new hardware, you know, helping the person upgrade their system for whatever they had, getting rid of viruses and spam, helping them straighten out the rat's nest of wiring. Hey, this, this wire doesn't go anyplace. Oh, I wondered what that did. <laughs> it's not attached to anything on either end but they're afraid to remove it because they don't know what it does. Help them make their computers to be more efficient. There's nothing worse than the slow computer that only has like one megabyte of RAM in it, right? And educate them in how to use their computers better to make them more money. And people say, well, why can't, you know, university students do that already? And it's because they don't have the confidence necessary to go out and sell themselves. They don't know the legal aspects of having a business. They don't know that they can just go to this website, fill in a bit of information and click and become a company. They don't have the skills to make advertising material to take it out and do this. 
Project Kawa will do all of that. We will make the skeleton contracts that are legal in your country. We will make the skeleton advertising materials in your language. And all you'll have to fill in is your name, your contact information, print it off, fold it up, and take it out to the customers. The customers will work with you to figure out what services you can provide to them and what services they need. And you put that in your contract. You don't promise anything more than what you know how to do. And that's your contract. And you say, I will do these things for so much money every month. Now, these are small businesses. They can't afford a full-time systems administrator. But that's OK, because you may have six customers that you spread your time between them. So they can afford one-sixth of you. And that way, you have multiple customers. In case one customer says, I don't want to be your customer anymore, you have five others to help keep you going until you find another sixth customer. In some cases, it might be seven. In some cases, it might be five. It depends on you. But this is a part-time job. And during the rest of the time, you're going to university. You're learning more information, how to do things better. And you're, earning, you're, you're learning a career. How does this benefit the small business person? It makes their systems more available all the time. It gives them somebody, a neutral person, that they can go to and say, I need help with this. I, is there software that can help me with this? And you can go and look on the net to see if there's free software that would help them solve that problem. It helps them because their computers are much more likely to stay up rather than go down. And we can get statistics on this. It means that there may be companies that they have support from already that they're doing support over the telephone. But did you ever try and give support over the telephone? After three hours, you figure out that their mouse really isn't attached to the PC, or that they're holding it backwards, or that there's some other simple thing. So these companies that do what we call second level support would love to have a student who's living close to the customer who can go to the customer and now they are talking to a knowledgeable person instead of talking to the customer themselves. They would love that and they would help support you. So these are things that, you know, why the, the, the small business person would, would love to have this type of help. Now, how does this help the community? I recently was trying to help the city of Florinopolis start up a uh, industrial park where they had all these companies coming in to say, we want to set up businesses in Florinopolis. And they got right up to the end, and the company said, OK, where are the computer people that we need to help keep our companies going. And the government of Florinopolis said, well, we have universities that graduate any number of people. No, no. We want to know where they are now. We're not going to wait till next year. You know, we've been told that the cloud is going to provide all the services and information and computers that we need. This is just crap. I'm sorry. As we get more and more technological, as we go more and more into having computers in our lives, we need more local support and not less. We need more trained people to help mom and pop use these wonderful things we call computers to the best and most efficient way. And so having these people in the local community means that these companies can now have the expertise that they need because they're not going to bring this expertise from the United States or from England. They expect to have it here. If they, were, if they wanted to have that expertise in the United States, they would hire people from the United States. They need 
he, that expertise here. And we are sorely missing that. So the target market for the Project Tower professional is a small company of one to 10 people in the audience, in the office. It's people that can't afford a full-time systems administrator. And it's people that want to have contact with the customer about four hours a week. So if you have six customers, that's 24 hours a week that you're working to make that customer's business better, those customers' business better. Now, if you do this, the work on that, you find out that you can make about 1,200 US dollars a month from these small businesses. It might be a little bit less, but that's a good target. And that's a really good salary for somebody who's doing this part time. So how do you do this? The steps to becoming a professional. We're, we're still working on the, on the website, projectcala.com. But I will tell you that when the site is finished, it will tell you exactly how to become this Project Cala professional. And you can go there and you can read everything on the website. Nothing will be blocked. You don't even have to log in. You can look at it, you can say, yes, this sounds good. You can download the contracts, you can download the advertising materials, don't even have to log in. If you want to log in, if you want to communicate and ask questions and communicate with the, with the community, you're going to have to create a login. And the reason for that is because we want you to be polite. We want you to be professionals. And if you're not, we are going to block you because we don't want to have people come in there and create problems and stuff like that. But you're still not going to have to pay any money. It's still going to be free. There's a next step, and that step is to become a Project Kawa professional. This is to use the brand of Project Kawa. If you would like to say, I've been trained, I am a Project Kawa professional, it's just like the swoosh on Nike then you will have to become a member. And that may be a small charge or it could still be free. But what will happen is we will expect you to do professional things. We'll expect you to get certifications showing that you know what you're talking about. And that will allow you to charge more and have more customers than if you don't. So, you know, we are going to create a brand a Project Cal professional, so that when small business people go out to look for help, they'll know who to look for to get the best help. How much training are you going to need? Not very much technical training. You're going to know most of what you need. And we will have forums and things where you can ask questions. If there's things you don't know how to do that are beyond the scope of what you have, you'll be able to reach out to other Project Cala professionals and say, I'd like to subcontract. You know, I don't know how to do what, you're, what my customer is asking, but he does. And so, no, this is not in my contract. It's not what we agreed on. So you're going to have to pay extra, Mr. Customer, for this person to come help you with that. But that will be able to solve a lot of the customer's problems. So over time, more and more uh, skills are earned by the Project Cal professional as you go from freshman in college and university through to senior. When you get to be a senior, you're going to start thinking about what I want to do with the rest of my life. Maybe you want to be a systems administrator in this type of a thing. That's fine. Great. But maybe you want to go on and do something else. And so you sell your business to an incoming freshman. You say, I have six customers. I want you to take care of them as you go through university. And the freshman starts out and you mentor them and slowly you pass off your customers to them. So the customer continues to have good support. And you walk away with a little bit of money to start your next business. So Project Kawa is really about nonprofit education. And we were looking for products 
to be able to sell to customers. I'm going to have to go a little bit faster. I'm sorry about that. Um, we were looking for products to sell because these students said, oh, I understand about service, but I really like something to sell to my customer. And again, I ran into a stopping point because I didn't have something they could sell until Caninas Lucas. And with Caninas Lucas, we started to produce these little computers. And again, we had project goals, not just to create a little computer, but to create design and manufacturing of these type of computers in Brazil and the rest of Latin America, to create jobs instead of sending billions of reais every year to China or the United States or Europe to keep those reais here, creating jobs for people like you. And we tried to fix the Cambridge problem, which was that people knew less about computers today going into university than they did 20 years ago. That was why the Raspberry Pi Foundation created the Raspberry Pi. But the problem in Brazil, as you know, is the Raspberry Pi is very expensive given the high cost of import duties. And by manufacturing this inside of Brazil, we're able to lower those manufacturing duties. It's not the fact that the Chinese get paid less than you do, or you get paid more. Because when you spread that difference in cost over 6,000 boards a day on a robot, the price per computer goes down to close to zero. The problem is the lack of expertise and the lack of taking the risk of designing a computer like this and whether or not it's going to sell in the Latin American market. And the University of Sao Paulo has taken on that risk so that little companies inside of Brazil can now manufacture these to as many as the Brazilian and Latin American market needs. And what that means is that you will now be able to innovate and once you innovate, be able to get as many of these as you want. Not be limited to the number of Raspberry Pis which can be imported into Brazil in the suitcase of your uncles and fathers who go to the United States. We tried to manufacture the Raspberry Pi in Brazil. We tried for two years. At the end, they said no. There's still lots of things that are wrong with the Raspberry Pi. This is about the Raspberry Pi 3. I know the Raspberry Pi 4 is out. But some of the things that are still wrong with the Raspberry Pi 4 is it doesn't work in the temperatures that are needed in Brazil. Their operating temperature is 50 degrees Celsius. You've seen pictures of the Raspberry Pi with a huge heat sink on it and a gigantic fan just to keep it cool enough to do regular work. This uses one watt of electrical power and therefore doesn't generate enough heat to need anything more than a nice heat sink. It works at 70 degrees Celsius, which is enough differential that could even operate in Manaus without a fan. So there's lots of different things. I'll let you explore the differences between the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 and the Labrador. But the overall plan is that LSI Tech designs and manufactures these and makes them available to businesses to manufacture. And then we can export these to all of the countries in the Mercosur Agreement for less money than they could buy the equivalent CPU from China. And the money comes back to Latin America to Brazil and to other countries that want to be able to manufacture the same thing. We will share our expertise. And over time, we're going to make this completely blobless. There are not going to be any Trojan horses or malware that can be hidden inside either the operating system or the CPU. Here's the specs in the Labrador. You can see these if you go to the net. 
So how does this come back to Raspberry Pi? I mean, it comes back to uh, Project Kawan. And the reason it comes back to, oh, you've seen the Labrador. You may not have seen the Pulga. This is a small sensor computer that we're also building as part of the program. And the Pulga is going to be used to measure sensors and stuff. But here's the four applications that we can implement immediately with the Labrador. Udo, a point of sale and ERP system, free software on top of the Labrador to allow small businesses to run their cash registers and so forth. Kodi, a multimedia system and first connection to the internet for people. Also could be a security device by adding a webcam pointed at your front door. Freedom Box, a small home and business server that can keep your data away from Google and Amazon and Microsoft. And finally, it's a fun one, Frets on Fire, which is a Guitar Hero free software package. So these are the things that we're trying to do. And I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll be around for the rest of the day. You can talk to me about Project Kawa. Look for Project Kawa to be into production by around December of this year. Thank you. Thank you.